Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Montreal-based jazz pianist Zan Shapilk. He opened up about his latest 2022 CD. It's a live one called Alive on Just In Time Records. It's a collective of musicians improvising in their natural habitat, the jazz club, playing music for the sake of music and never repeating themselves, creating the sounds that they will never be able to replicate. He's originally from Paris moved to New York back in 1995, and now he calls Montreal home. Along with the music, he has built a strong international reputation as an educator. Enjoy this story. Hey, man, thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So I, I wanted to first and foremost, you know, kind of ask you, you know, you have a new live album out. It's during a time where we haven't had live music for about two years. So what does this project mean for you? Every every concert, every every moment of music means a lot to me in general. You know, this that particular moment was a bit special because, by, as you as you pointed out, there was like there were like two years of almost you know no activity, no concert, no live concerts and stuff like that. So this was one of the very very first concert I I I, I gave uh, after the whole you know pandemic confinement etc. period and. Uh, the very first concert with this particular trio at this particular venue after that period. And so what happened is that it felt like suddenly uh, a return to, more than a return to normal, a return to life, really. Uh, therefore, the name of the album. I guess it's just a, a tribute to the power of music uh, and uh, to bring people together and to bring us back to life at a moment where we, when we really needed it, you know, and I think we all felt that particular vibration, vibration at that particular night, hence my, my decision to release the album, because I, I could feel it in the recording too, I could feel it in the music itself. So as we kind of, you know, get into 2022 more, we're getting near spring, hopefully things open up more, what kind of hopes do you have to get back to live music? Well, the first hope I have is that there will be some kind of peace on this planet because, you know, I think it's very discouraging to see that, uh, you know, in spite of so many years and so many sad events in the history of humanity, we haven't made so much progress, you know, and uh, that is really very sad on top of the COVID, you know, the, the what's happening right now in Ukraine. I mean, it, it's it's very discouraging and and. That's why, you know, I always tried, I'm sorry for mentioning politics a little bit, but uh, that's why I always try to take politics out of music. I think music is one of the forces that, that really bring people together. It's a universal force that can bring people from all kinds of places, languages, uh, colors, uh, you name it, uh, sexes and genders, or, uh, you know, that it's a force to bring people together. What I will keep doing at my, you know, at my modest and individual level is continue to do, to make music the way I've always done it, which means, you know, uh, for the sake of music itself. You know, I think the language of tones is one of the most powerful language we can find to, to kind of like, uh, face hurdles and difficulties and help other people sometime. Of course, it's pretty limited. You know, when, when the war happens, you know, music is powerless. And so, but uh, like I said, I will keep doing my best uh, to use the language of tone in the best possible way and uh, to the best of my abilities with all the musicians that I like to play with. You know, that's all I can do, really. So, you know, during this time of COVID lockdown and quarantine, you know, we all had time with ourselves, lots of self-reflection, reevaluating our lives. What did you learn about yourself that maybe you didn't realize before that's going to make you even more strong and stronger as we get back out to the world and perform live? And you have a new album to promote. Well, you know, I learn about myself every day, you know, good and bad things. <laughs> depends on the day, depends on what happens, you know. Uh, I, I think, you know, you, you don't really learn. I mean, I, I don't think you learn about yourself. I think you learn how to live with yourself better and better or sometimes it turns you know you have turns for the worse at some period in your life where you know you you become your worst enemy so to speak and it happens and it's i've always thought that you don't get better with age i don't feel i get better i get different i think you get different all the time you know uh we're, we're different people from one day to the other that's how i feel and that's certainly how i feel as a musician 
So I think what I what I maybe what I learned is not to think too much about the future, not to you know, not to put too much pressure on myself and not to actually think, oh I should get better and this and that. I, I welcome the difference. I welcome the unexpected. I welcome that one morning I wake up and something is completely different and I don't even know what it is sometimes. So I, I think that that would be that's always been my philosophy and I think it has helped me quite a bit during those times because, you know, obviously Things were in, unpredictable, and you had to uh, you had to be patient, which is not my best quality. So I think that kind of philosophy, if you can call it like that, or attitude towards life, kind of helped me not to expect too much and see see what happens in music, like in life. You know, improvise. I'm an improviser. You know, so I, I try to no, you know, I try not to have too many expectations. I try not to predict things too much. And very often I try to forget things as fast as I can to actually go to the next step as fresh as I can be. You know, we all have these flashpoints in our life where, you know, big big moments happen for us. And one of those is when you actually do get into something like being a musician or jazz. When did that happen for you? How did that happen where you decided that improvised music and jazz was going to be what you would pursue in life? Oh, uh, well, that's an easy question because I, I very easily remember that moment. I mean, my uncles were, you know, big jazz fans and they initiated me to, to music in general, like classical music and jazz mostly. They, they were not really rock fans, not the, not, the, not the same generation. So they initiated me to Louis Armstrong, Sidney Bechet, and uh, Django Reinhardt, and uh, Duke Ellington, and in classical Beethoven, Chopin, Schubert, you name it, Brahms, etc. So what happened is that one day they were big, big, big by the Baker fans, you know, and uh, so they were looking for this vinyl record of Dick that they couldn't find, and one day they f they found some good, some day they found it. I don't know, I can't remember where. So they went home with their record, with the vinyl of Dix, you know, in 1927 with Frankie Trombor, and they put it on the turntable, and I heard that, and I really, like Dix, really sent me something that I still remember to this day. I can't, the most beautiful things I've ever heard. I think Dix was really that, that mix of, like, purity and distance and... I mean, the sound that he had, the notes that he chose, there was something that really resonated in me very powerfully and still does. By the way, I found that vinyl on the internet like a couple of months ago, and I, I re-bought it, so I have it <laughs> in my collection now, and I'm very happy. So that, nice. that, totally like, that totally made me fall in love with jazz. At the time, I wasn't very aware of all that it implied and the, 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 the vastness of the world of jazz and improvisation. That came progressively, but, but that was definitely the first big spark for me, for sure. So what about a live show? What was the first live jazz show you saw that made you think, wow, this is incredible? I, it might not be the first, but it was. That's the one I'm, I'm going to talk about. Is I, A friend of mine was a really good pianist. We were like in our early 20s, and he said that the great French pianist Martial Solal was going to play in a club in Paris that was a very small club. And I, I didn't really know Martial, and at the time I was a bit full of myself, you know, I was like uh, thinking that I was this really hot shot and a really good pianist. So I, I was reluctant to go, I was like, oh, I'm, oh it's going to be, I don't know. I was a bit like more of a traditional jazz guy at the time, you know, I was a bit turned on uh, against modern jazz because I was influenced by my uncle's views, you know. It, of course it changed after, <laughs> it changed pretty fast uh, in the next few years, but... So I went to the club to to hear Martial, and I, I he just totally killed me. He just, I, I went back home and I told my parents, I, I don't want to be a musician. That guy, now now that I've heard that guy, I don't even want to touch the piano. It was like unbelievable. It was a moment of grace and virtuosity and purity and the clarity and the technique, the sound. Everything was so incredible that. You know, it totally changed my life, and um, we became friends years later, and I told him one several times. I said, I, I owe you a big debt because you made me a musician. Before that, I was just a brat, you know. That day, I became a musician without knowing it. It was painful at first, but then, well, then I went to practicing for real. <laughs> that really was the right thing to do. So, you know, you've been fortunate throughout your life to be around some pretty heavy jazz cats like Roy Haynes, Michael Brecker, 
you know, Lenny White, Chris Potter, the list goes on. And I'm curious, what did you learn from those big names, legends, and luminaries that you, in turn, have taught younger players you get around? I think those are not the people I learned the, the most from, really. You know, uh, they're very famous. I respect them tremendously. You know, somebody like Roy Haynes is obviously, you know, a legend. But, you know, I don't... To me, the, the, the size of the name doesn't mean much, you know. I mean, the people with whom I learn the most are people who are much less known than that. You know, I mean, somebody like Harry Honig, even though he's very well known now, but, uh, or François Moutin, the bass player with whom I've played since I'm 21, or vocalist Elizabeth Contomanu, saxophonist Sam Newsom, you know, like Billy Hart, you know, with whom I'm, I've been fortunate to play quite a bit. Uh, Boris Kozlov, bass player, and now the people that I play with here. You know, I think I learn from the people that I play with, you know, on a, on a regular basis that to me are my family. And I, I don't, to me the size of the name, size doesn't matter, excuse me, the, the humor here, the risky humor, but I think the size of the reputation is, has not much to do, you know. I think really like I learn a lot from everybody I play with and some musician I've played much more than the one that you just mentioned with whom I played maybe once or twice. So I learned a lot from Francois Nari, for example, playing with those cats since uh, now uh, over 20 years and all that we've developed together and what we still do now to this day uh, is to me, that's, that's a huge chunk of my musical life. And I try to transmit that to my students under the form of passion not under the form of receipts or techniques or concept, because that's not how I work, but I try to convey to them all the passion that we have needed to play that music over the years. Sometimes, you know, not in difficult conditions, not being very known, playing in small places, not getting paid much, playing on bad pianos, and you name it. But I think that's what I try to show my students, that with the passion, you keep going and, and you have no choice, you know. And that's what I try to convey to them, first and foremost, the passion and the strength, of course. Absolutely. So when you left Paris and came to New York, and now you're in Montreal, did you always have a dream of leaving and coming into other hotbeds of jazz? How did this kind of geographical migration happen for you? Well, it was kind of natural. I mean, first of all, I was born and raised in Paris, so my career started in Paris quite naturally. And then, you know... I, after a while, I saw the moment where I, things started to get predictable. And, and I don't know, I have this kind of mental issue that when things get predictable, I get bored. So I decided to go to New York, which was a pretty natural decision for a jazz musician. I was already age 23, so I was not, uh, sorry, 33. So I was not young at all. You know, I started being a professional musician late in life at 28. So at 33, I said, well, New York, jazz, that sounds like a logical place to, to go. And I, at first, I just wanted to visit, you know, stay a little bit. But then I liked the vibe. Of course, I heard some fantastic music. And it became almost, uh, I would say, unavoidable that I should want to stay there, which I did. And Montreal, you know, I got offered a, a good job at McGill University. And I... Montreal is a nice place. It's a, it was a different experience. It was a new part of my life, which I welcomed, you know, in many ways. Uh, I had young kids, so it was also time for a change for that. And, you know, I, I think I've always let things come to me and follow my instinct, you know. I don't really make decisions, really. I mean, life, it's a bit like music. Life tells me where to go. If music tells me where to go. Life tells me where to go. I'm not somebody who kind of, like, pushes things. I... I let them come to me and I take it as a sign and I say, okay, that sounds like the right thing to do right now. And, and I try to follow my instinct and my heart more than my reason. <laughs> that has, of course, put me into some difficult situations sometimes. And I think instinct is still the safest thing to, to follow, you know, in those important moments. You know, you've been at this for quite a while now. What's been your key to longevity? What's made you kind of tick and go through your career with, the, the level of energy that you've had all these years? I think passion. You know, like I said, passion is, is the key. I mean, I, I see lots of students, you know, I've had lots of students over the years who, who, don't have, who don't have that or don't know, you know, how to, uh, how can I say, to, to use it, you know, efficiently. And they, 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 they seem very like, uh, 
you know, they have all those routines and they practice a lot and they do this and they follow, all, they go to see uh, tons of teachers and this and that. For me, as a self-taught, you know, it, it has always been a love story. Love is, love is the engine, you know. I mean, how do you stay with the same person for years and years, which is my case. You know, I think it's, it's love. If you love the person, you know, sometimes, even though there are moments that are better than others and, you know, you have up and downs, which is perfectly normal. When you have the love for, for that person, you, you, you can make it work. You, you, can, you can go through the years and make it work, even if it's not always easy. And I think with music, it's exactly the same. It's a love story. You have to be in love. Sometimes students ask me, why should I listen to this and that? I said, you, there's no why. You're in love. You should love. You just listen to it because you love listening to it. If you don't love listening to it, then you have to ask yourself the question. Am I really, should I really make a, be a musician? Because it, it's all about love and passion. And that is the key to longevity. That is the key to, to the right form of energy. That is the key to, you know, to sometimes surmounting uh, obstacles and, and stuff like that. You know, I think it's the key to pretty much everything. That and, of course, working on your instrument and, and, and you know, practicing and being serious about what you do, of course. But, Love is the prerequisite. You know, there is this beautiful quote by Arthur Schnabel, a fantastic uh, classical pianist, who used to say, uh, love creates knowledge, but knowledge doesn't create love. Of course, it's very controversial, but I think it's a nice quote because it shows that if you have the love, then you're going to acquire the knowledge. You're going to do what's needed to to be what you want to be. If, if you start with the standpoint of just the knowledge, then you, law and you know you have to the love is not there naturally then you run into trouble and i see quite a few of my students uh, having that problem and sometimes they solve it which makes me very happy it's just a button to push and suddenly they feel the spark and then they become completely different musicians so you know you've had a lot of accomplishments over your career lots of things have happened what are you the proudest of when you really sit back and think about your career what have you done what's happened that's been something that you always kind of return to because it's been such a good part of your career? I would say more than career, we'll talk about, again, more like the, the music itself. I would say solo piano is definitely a big center of my life. I mean, solo piano is a big center of my life and have always, you know, it has been very problematic for years, you know, because... You know, trio was different because I played with Francois Nari. We, all, we did those trio records and they did some records with all the trios. And I felt like when I was playing trio, I found my, I would say I found my place more natural, you know, more easily, more naturally. There was something, you know, that fell into place more easily. With soap piano, it's a different situation. First of all, like I said, I started listening to Marcel Solal, who to me is, like a, a huge, I would say an influence because I never tried to copy him, but a huge inspiration uh, to me, for me, is, uh, is kind of the artatum of, of the second half of the 20th century. And, uh, and that was a huge, you know, that, that I was really, that, that, well, those were big shoes to try to follow, you know. And solo piano, you know, you're alone. You know, so if you're not inspired, you're not inspired. With trio, you can always get inspiration from your from your bandmates. And so for years, I was not really happy with my solo playing. I was sometimes, but you know, it was very. There was lots of fluctuations. But recently, I would say since maybe five or six years, solo piano. I started really. I started finding finding what I had found in trio much earlier, which was a certain stability, a certain place where I can be myself and play music and then listen to it and feel like, oh, okay, that, that's what I meant. That's good. I can listen to that and be happy. You know, and it's a, it's a fantastic, to me, it's a fantastic pleasure because it has taken a long time to get there. And now I know that solo piano is, uh, is something that's really at the center of my being and that I feel great about. And at the age of 61, it's, um, I'm happy I can finally say that, you know. Everyone has a perception of who you are, your family, your friends, your fans, but ultimately you live your life. Who do you think you are? I have no idea. Somebody different every day. You know, I mean, I don't know, a human being, uh, a little chunk of time and space that will hopefully uh, leave a little bit of something in terms of music, but I don't, 
I don't really uh, think about those things, really. You know, I don't really. Think, I think I am what I do, basically. If I if I wanted to give you a good a good answer, it's that I am what I do. I think people should be represented by their actions more than by their, you know, quality defects and this and that. So I am what I do, and if I do, a, if I am on stage and I give a good concert, then that's what I am, and that's good. Maybe the day after, I will do something stupid, and I will be stupid, then, <laughs> you know. But uh, but I am what I do primarily. I think actions really define people, most, first and foremost, and also and also their works. You know, when you look at somebody like, you know, I, I think in music in general, we try too much to know the people that have made the music. For example. We don't know much about Bach. We don't know much about Schubert. You know, we know a little bit more. But, but Bach is very mysterious. But his music he is his music. For me, I don't need to know him. I don't need to know if he shaved in the morning or if he was an angry man, which I think he was by, by certain account, or if he was this or that. I think when I when I when I listen to his music, you know, I read Chopin letters and Chopin's biographical because I, I love Chopin. But then it didn't mean much once I put a record and I listened to his music played by a good musician. Now, then, then I know who he is. So I think there's a, music says more about people than, you know, letters or biographies or reflections or whatever, analyzes, you name it. And I hope my music says something about me. That's certainly what I, as a musician, what I hope the most is that my music says something about me. And if it does, I think that's quite enough, actually. Beautiful. My final question to you is this. Why do you love jazz? Why do you love someone? Why do you love why do you love that person and not that other person? Why do you love that food and not another food? It's a mystery. Love is a mystery. I think love has to remain a mystery. So I love jazz because like I said, when I listen to Biggs and then of course to many others, it just lit my there was this light bulb that lit in my in my brain, in my heart and my body got warm and all excited, and I felt like some hormones inundating my my body, and and that's what I still feel when I listen to you know Charlie Parker or Coltrane or Tatum or Marcel Sonal, and that's it. That's I wouldn't say there is a reason to it. I ju- I would just say it's like I said, it's a no choice thing. I just heard it and I loved it, and and that was it. Now it's my you know it's a it's a love story that will end with me. So I think. Uh, uh, that's all, that's pretty much all I can say about it. That's a great answer. Hey, thank you for taking some time out for Neon Jazz. No today. problem, with the album. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank Absolutely. you. That was a pleasure, man. And I really enjoyed it. Good luck with everything. Right. I hope we will keep in touch, but it was really very enjoyable. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York City, Montreal, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Mr. Peelk for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.